Hi there. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to use the microphone. I don't usually use one, because I'm loud. Um, but I've been told that it's been very helpful in other presentations thus far. So I'll try to go by the rule here. Um, two things. One is that I talk really fast. <laughs> and if I start speeding up, just you know, let me know. Slow down, and I will try to rein it in. The second is that I have um, assessments up here, just evaluations of the speaker on the second table. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to hold them up. So anyone who came in later than when I earlier asked people to grab one, if you could fill them out quickly and leave them at the end. Um, federal grantors really like to know we're actually doing stuff, so they like to get those back. Um, as uh, my kind introduction stated, I, I do a lot around parents with disabilities and their families in a number of different ways. And one of those things is to provide technical assistance either to attorneys or parents when they're in the child welfare or the family law system and they face loss of custody of their child based at least in part on the diagnosis that they have as uh, the disability diagnosis. So today, I've been asked to talk specifically about parents with intellectual disabilities, uh, low-functioning parents. And uh, so that's going to be the focus of our talk today. Uh, but I also want you to keep in mind when I have contact information at the end, if you have parents with other types of disabilities, we have a lot of resources around that as well. So the basic question, can people with disabilities parent? Yes, they can. 6.5% um, of the parent population in the United States is comprised of people with disabilities. Most of them never end up in the system at all, so you don't, you know, you don't see them perhaps in your work, but they are out there. And yes, even those with intellectual disabilities, because besides psychiatric disability, intellectual disability is the diagnosis that, that causes the most concern often within professional populations. I've listed some of the preeminent researchers on the topic of parents with intellectual disabilities. Because people with intellectual disabilities, low functioning individuals, comprise a very small portion by themselves of the entire population, a lot of this work is international. So we're pulling from many different countries, mainly all of these researchers are in Western countries, um, Northern European, um, Australian, Canadian, the United States. So these are all excellent people to, if you want to Google them, look at their research, get familiar with it. It can give you more insight into what type of data over the last 20 years, 30 years has, um, has been brought together at this point, talking about the ability of this population to parent. So first we're going to talk a little bit about the background of this population so we are all on the same page as to why they are difficult to represent in, in our society. From the 1900s to the 1960s, the United States government in almost every state had a policy of eugenics. Sterilization and institutionalization of this population, people with intellectual disabilities, was the norm. And as a result, they had neither the physiological, as a result of sterilization, or the social, as a result of institutionalization, ability to go out into the community and have families and form families. In the 1970s, the independent living movement, the disability rights movement, created um, a change in that dynamic so that people were not being sterilized, they were not being kept in institutions, they were in the community and began having families at a much higher rate. What happened then was that we see a lot of attitudinal bias, a lot of concern that these people can even be competent parents that they should have children, that they have a right to have children, um, being questioned, and we see removal. So from the first half of the century, what we really saw was it's in the best interest of the United States to keep these people out of society, institutions, and to keep them from procreating, sterilization. The last half, what we see is that they're in the community, but we have the feeling that in the best interest of the child, we should terminate their parental rights. And that's been sort of a guiding policy to the point that we have 37 states in which intellectual disability by itself is a grounds for removal of children. Um, and and that's, that's a great concern to the disability rights community. Disability as a status crime is sort of an interesting idea in this context. 
So that usually what we expect, right, is to see a, a nexus. We have an argument that typically there has to be a nexus. The parent's disability has to be detrimentally impacting children or we shouldn't really be concerned about it. Um, but in fact, there's very little um, oversight that that nexus be shown. It's, it's usually not really pushed evidentiarily. It's not very difficult to meet a showing that the disability is having an impact. Instead, it's almost more like a status crime. Like by having the label, the parent is automatically suspect. This is woven into, as I said, most state legislation. There's nothing unique um, about Nebraska in, in that respect. So I have some definitions. I'm not going to read through them all, but it's my definition of intellectual disabilities. Basically, it affects intellectual functioning. And I'm talking about both organic, so like mental retardation diagnosis, um, or differences due to damage. So people have traumatic brain injuries, TBIs. Maybe they've had chemotherapy, and as a result, they have cognitive difficulties. Attitudinal bias is a term that references the underlying societal belief in the pathology and inadequacy of people with disabilities. So it kind of underlies the idea of these people automatically are assumed that they shouldn't, they don't have a right to have children, they shouldn't have children, they can't be good parents. Accommodations is just, and when I'm talking about it here, is going to be the modification of typical procedures and services or the addition of procedures and services in order to help these parents participate in the process of child welfare, typically reunification and reuniting with their children permanently. Mutual adaptation, this is a phenomenon whereby very young parents and children adapt to common task behaviors or accommodate each other. And if, if I have a chance, I'll get to that. It's more of a clinical point. So why do we care about this issue? It's a small group of parents. Um, the main reason is that removal, unnecessary removals, but any removals, really, are traumatic for children, and foster care is dangerous. We know from many, many, many studies that the rates of injury, the risks of certain types of abuse, um, even the risk of death is higher in foster care than in a typical home. There are situations where children must be removed, clearly. If they're being abused or neglected, that can't be remedied in the home, that the child needs to be removed. But there's a lot of removal that is traumatic for the child and was not necessary. It's based on the attitudinal bias, assumptions, speculations about behavior, as opposed to abuse or neglective behavior. Also, large-scale removals for status are suspect. When you say we're going to remove these children basically because we find their parent to be an inferior social being, that's suspect in the United States. Failing to require an actual ne nexus between intellectual disability and actually some detriment to the child, basically it debases the process. We're supposed to be showing that the state intervenes only when a parent is not fit, not because a parent has a status definition. So how are we doing Nebraska? Not so good, not so bad, basically the same as most states. You have legislation that says that the court may terminate parental rights between the parents and the child based on these conditions. And you go through a whole bunch of really like, you know, behavior stuff, right? Debauchery, use of drugs, alcohol, lewd, lascivious behavior, really awful stuff, or they're disabled. <laughs> and they're not able to discharge parental responsibilities because of it. Um, there's a lot of work that's come out of the University of Minnesota with um, professors Liberté and Lightfoot talking about how damaging having these types of issues conflated is for trying to ensure the rights of people with disabilities in the system. When you conflate debauchery and alcoholism and drug use with a, a diagnosis of mental retardation, um, it does a lot to inform the reader of what type of person that is. You say it makes them a socially questionable person to include them in that group. Now if you didn't have this and they were still doing those things, you could still terminate their parental rights is there any specific reason we need to name them out? Most people will typically say no. If they are a parent with a disability or they're not a parent with a disability, if they're drinking and committing lascivious behavior and using illegal drugs, you can still take their child in either instance. I wanted to make a comment because looking at your stats, I saw you had this um, section on Indians. Um, Native people have the highest incident of disability in the nation, 27%. That's typical of all post-colonial indigenous populations in Western countries. Hovers around 27 to 32 percent. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, the United States. Um, 
I have this in my PowerPoint, and you can just, if you end up with a case, it's an Indian Child Welfare Act case. You just need to understand that disability is not an in run around the Indian Child Welfare Act. That just because a parent has a disability does not mean active efforts don't have to be made and the usual steps don't have to be taken. Regardless of this section, you, those, the, the requirements of ICWA still apply. How can you consider this under Nebraska law? Looking at Nebraska law, there's the, it's whether they have the, the disability, the existence of the disability, and showing that it's been going on for a long time. Those don't seem to have much action in your case law. I think those are usually uncontested points. The illness or deficiency must cause parental deficiency. This is the one where the action seems to take place for the most part. And in order to terminate, the, clear, the state has to show by clear and convincing evidence that nexus. Now, how is that usually shown? In cases all over the country, the way that social service workers typically meet their evidentiary burden to show that a parental deficit is creating um, a detrimental impact on the child is through evaluations by mental health professors, by professionals, or through providing services and then showing through testimony and reports, et cetera, that the parent is not benefiting. I'm not going to read this to you, <laughs> but again, it's here. This is the actual language from the ADA. So enter the ADA, you know, back in Washington. Um, both the ADA and its precursor, which is Section 504 of the Rehab Act, says quite clearly under Title II that child welfare agencies are public agencies, public programs, and they must make reasonable modifications to ensure effective participation and less fundamental alteration to the program would result. Usually that's not what's being requested. Usually when we're saying, please accommodate this parent, they have intellectual disability, we're, say we're not saying you have to do something wildly different. But if you usually give an evaluation, it needs to be an evaluation that's accommodated for this population. And we'll get to what that would look like. And it goes through here that you also may provide special benefits beyond those required by the regulation to people with disabilities. So for example, if a parent usually just gets parent skill training, you know, how to keep your house clean, feed your child, get them places on time. A parent with intellectual disability may need parent-child interactive therapy, which is pretty common, but not in every case, usually. They may really need that to work on things like cue reading, responsiveness, sensitivity to the child, and build attachment and sensitivity. So that would be an example of, of a special benefit you might ask for. And these are the, just the, um, citations for this so you can locate them. The first one is actually, you know, citing the act and then the CFR are the, are the regs for this. So adapted services when they have an intellectual disability. What we basically want to see is that necessary steps are taken to make sure, first of all, that a parent that comes to your attention that you are representing has regular medical care and current um, functioning is established. You really need to know what's going on with your parent. Often if they have an intellectual disability, a lot of other things are hidden and masked and you never hear about them. They may also have you know, scoliosis and be in a lot of pain from that. They may have a liver condition, they may have depression, but no one's paying attention to those things, they're focusing on the intellectual disability because that's what they find troubling as an aspect of them as a parent. But it's going to affect how well they do services, how well they work with you, et cetera. Um, they're probably going to need personal therapy around themselves, around disability and parenting with someone who's familiar with the disability community, with people with intellectual disability. Um, most of the time, I think most of you would agree that we're seeing mothers. Most often it's, it's mothers in the system. Um, women with intellectual disability have exceedingly high rates of childhood trauma, of rape, of um, abuse. They're a very vulnerable population, and so many of them come with histories that are quite traumatic. And so therapy for themselves is going to be maybe more important than it is in many of the cases that you are on. You want to make sure that you are using the resources in the disability community that you may not be familiar with because you typically don't need them. So when you have a client who needs things like personal attendance services or maybe eligible for um, social security disability <coughs> income but hasn't gotten hooked up for that, that may have a right to go to the head of the line in some instances for, for housing through federal or state housing. Um, places like independent living centers, or in this case with intellectual disability, the ARC um, of Nebraska, those are the sorts of places that can really help get those 
extra services in place that will make your job easier as you represent the client. You want to make sure that parent-child intervention happens around both parenting skills to address neglect and attachment-based parenting interventions. And that's like I was talking about to deal with sensitivity and attachment, responsiveness, cue reading, all things that can be of concern with this parent population. Um, also, we, there was a, an earlier presentation on, um, on children and using good caretaking for children in daycare as um, a way to create resiliency for them, actually, if their home is less stable. And, you know, Head Start and early Head Start programs have been effective in helping with that with this population of parents as well. So that if they have their child in early Head Start or Head Start, for instance, some of the concerns about their ability to support their children developmentally can be addressed. And then um, community support and social groups to address isolation. This population tends to get very isolated, um, especially the single moms. You see a lot of that. So if there are any sort of social um, groups that are done through independent living centers or ARCs or things like that, it can be really helpful for them. Um, and then legal support to address tangential matters. These people tend to be extremely underhoused, so housing can be a big issue in these cases. Um, also domestic violence. As I said before, they're quite susceptible to abuse, um, financial abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and so making sure that if they need protection from someone who, who is targeting them in their community, then they get that. And then when you have all of these things, when you've addressed as much of this as the, your client seems to need, that would be the time for a parenting assessment to be done. Usually what happens is that either full parenting assessments don't happen or they happen really at the end when you know, either services have or haven't been given. But usually these other types of services are not provided to the parents before. And so they're not able to present well because there's so much other stuff going on. So um, uh, evaluations, this is uh, Megan Kirschbaum, Dr. Megan Kirschbaum is a fellow at the Zero to Three Institute, which is the, a national institute focused on the well-being of young children, zero to three focuses a lot on brain development and you know basically this is what, something that she presented on what proper evaluations for parents with intellectual disabilities are going to look like. I'm just going to highlight a few things. It's really important that the people evaluating parents with intellectual disability, one, have the proper training and the American Psychological Association guidelines say if you don't have experience with a population that you've been asked to do an assessment on a member of that population, you, either need, you need to either say, I don't have it, and not do it, or you need to consult with someone who does have that expertise in order to fill in the gap. So we don't often see that happen. And so that's something to really be pushing on, that the person actually have expertise or seek proper consultation to work with this population. One of the other highlights is that they're typically stuck in this um, habit of using certain measures to uh, evaluate parents and the parent-child relationship. Um, Again, under the APA guidelines, they're supposed to be doing a lot of observation of the parent and child, sort of triangulate it, right? Look at the history, interviewing, have um, observation. Observation is more expensive and time consuming and often gets left off. But because they're coming in speculating about whether this person can parent based on the disability, because they're going to have their own attitudinal bias, it's really important that that observation piece happen. Um, and as to written measures, things like IQ tests, really it's kind of been debunked that IQ is going to tell you anything about the ability of a parent to parent. IQ simply doesn't correlate to risk of abuse and, and neglect until, you, you know, maybe when you get to extremely low levels. But for most of the people that we see functioning and having children, um, that, there's just not a correlation there. So things like IQ testing would be a really improper way to evaluate a parent's parenting capacity. Um, and the problem with a lot of measures that are used, like you'll see things like Rorschachs being used with these parents, those are not normed for this population. If you contact test makers, which we have done um, in other studies, they will say, no, 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 my test is not meant for that population. Very clearly, this test is not intended for this group of people, but it gets out there and it gets used and people get in the habit of using them, and then when they have a parent with intellectual disability, they just have a difficult time having any sort of plasticity around what type of measures they're gonna use, adopt and use. So this is a great list for you to have when you're gonna be challenging someone who's 
done an evaluation that you feel is unfair, is, is not using proper measures, is biased, you'll want to review this and see if it was done you know, according to best practice standards, basically. Parent-child intervention. There, there are two main types, as I said, of interventions that we see. One is the parenting skills training, and you see that a lot. It's pretty common in child welfare. And then there's more attachment um, based parent-child intervention. So built on work like, you know, like Ainsworth and Bowlby talk a lot about the need to have um, sensitivity in parenting and, and the role of attachment in that, so building attachment. And that has been remarkably useful with this population. You just don't see it very often, unfortunately, because of the funding and financial piece. But this goes back to the ADA issue. They'll say, well, that's not something we typically offer. Well, under the ADA, you need to accommodate. This population needs this type of service in order to have a meaningful opportunity to actually succeed in the reunification process. It needs to begin very early, as early as possible. Often what we have seen and has been problematic across the country is that they want to start this a little bit before permanency planning, when they have to show that they've met the requirements for providing services. And I understand that comes up because you know, people are so pressed. Social workers have huge numbers of clients and, and they're often doing the best they can, but they get to these clients later in the game. And the fact is they take longer to process and learn. And there's going to have to be special techniques used with them to help them process and learn. And it takes more time. So where maybe you can do that with some other populations, this population you have to start really, really early with anything that you want to be able to measure outcomes on prior to the, to the end of the case, prior to permanency uh, planning. It's really important that you have intervention as much as possible taking place in natural settings. We have a tendency to use centers because it's more cost effective, have everyone come there. Um, but you get really much lower, um, lower positive outcomes when you're taking them out of their home to more institutional settings. Part of that has to do with this population sensitivity to stress and also that they tend to end up in situations with people they feel um, are hostile to them, the foster parents, other people judging them. They have such a history of trauma and being judged negatively that they perform really poorly often in those types of settings. So this is another list that you can reference later to look at whether or not the types of interventions being provided are good or to plan for case planning. So independent investigation, when you get your case, you really need to have, as I said, a thorough discussion with your client about disability because they may have other disabilities. You also might want to know when did they get their disability. Now someone who has you know, uh, been receiving special education and been in the system since they were little children is going to probably be different to work with than someone who is still sort of in the trauma of having just gotten out of rehab after a severe car accident. And now they have a change in their functioning level that they didn't have before. So you just need to have an idea of what is the history with this disability. Not everyone who comes in has always been as you see them now. Um, do they use any medications? If so, what are the effects? This is something that comes up where the court can be really concerned because they're on medications, especially we see this with traumatic brain injury, um, other types of injuries that have caused cognitive functioning changes, that they're very concerned about the effect of medications that might be for pain that also dull the parent's ability to supervise the child. Do they have the medication they're supposed to have? Are they able to access it? Is it legal? Um, in California, we have medical marijuana. Well, its legality is sort of up in the air. If you have someone come in who has a prescription for medical marijuana, the court still, A, is going to be concerned about the effect of that drug, but B, also may see it as not legal and another ding against the parent. Um, are they in any pain or illness? Do they need medical attention? Are they safe? Are they, are they currently in a DV situation? Are they in a homeless situation? Are they, you know, what's going on with them? Again, they tend to be very underhoused and are very vulnerable to domestic violence issues. What are their, who are their support people? Who, who is their family? Um, do they have anyone who's there who can intellectually interpret for them? Who knows them, can read their facial cues, tell if they're getting what's being talked about, or if they're just kind of yes mamming whoever's talking, right? Which is a coping mechanism that they can tend to use and they'll use with their attorneys as well. Um, are they literate? 
there's an assumption because they can sign their names on documents sometimes that they're literate. There's a very low literacy rate among this population. Um, talked about housing, income. Are they hooked up to income services, to their social security disability income? Just because it exists and people have a right to it does not mean anyone has assisted them in getting connected to those resources. And that can be really helpful to them. Um, is there any attitudinal bias in the caseworker? You want to talk to them about what is the case, how do they feel the caseworker feels about them? Um, again, they can be really susceptible and can sense when they're kind of being looked down upon, um, thought of as not a decent parent, not a good parent. They respond very strongly to that because they have these long histories of shame often. So if they're feeling really negatively about how they're being treated by the caseworker, you need to know that. Um, what accommodations for court and child welfare agency? They may have you know, other involvements like deafness that will require, for instance, an ASL interpreter if they do sign language. But they may also need the accommodation, as I spoke of, of having an intellectual interpreter, having someone they're familiar with, or a professional who works with people with intellectual disability, who can be there with them at mediations and at hearings to ensure that they are actually meaningfully participating in that process, that they get what's going on, helping them slow down proceedings, get clear on what something means, make sure they understand things before they sign them or agree to them in court or in mediation. Oh, and, and if they have any questions about the process, we sometimes tend to skip over that. Okay, talking to the caseworker themselves about the disability issue. You want to talk to the social worker and see how much they actually know about your client's disability. They, again, they have so many clients often, they sometimes aren't even aware of what the disabilities are. Um, reviewing the file for misdiagnosis, they say, oh, this person has intellectual disability. Well, no, actually they they don't, they have cerebral palsy, they just have speech involvement and you assumed it was intellectual disability. You know, those are the types of things. You want to make sure they actually don't have a misdiagnosis going on. And checking for attitudinal bias. We see things like, you know, obviously the parent won't be able to parent due to their cognitive involvement. Uh, we see it with other disabilities as well. You know, the parent is a, a victim of epilepsy. The parent is wheelchair bound. This kind of really tragic language, which kind of cues you automatically that they are assuming that these people are not fully functioning, are victims of their disability, and aren't going to do as well. It's probably a good idea to get an agreement with social services that your client is disabled and that the ADA applies, which it clearly does, but that can be more difficult sometimes than it sounds. You know, uh, When it comes down to it, obviously, the ADA does apply to these public agencies under Title II. But you want to make sure they understand that. Since it doesn't discuss details of child welfare proceedings, often both attorneys and social workers aren't even thinking about the ADA or how it might apply to their case. Um, you want to discuss with them early whatever accommodations you think your client might need and make sure that they're aware of any durable medical equipment or medication needs. Tip, there are many cases where these parents and their children enter the system because either there's a domestic violence incident or the parent goes to have the child at the hospital is, um, is understood, acknowledged, recognized to have a disability and the hospital staff panics and they call Child Protective Services or the police who respond to the, to the DV charge deal with that but then seeing that the parent has a developmental or intellectual disability they call Child Protective Services. So you want to know like what, what was the grounds that was going on there. And then who, if anyone, interpreted for the parent, who communicated for the parent to the doctors and to the police. Was it, you know, in the case of domestic violence, there'll be, you know, there's situations where the police will come in and mom who has intellectual disability is the victim, but they will ask the perpetrator what happened because they don't see mom as being a reliable source of information because of the intellectual disability. Or at the hospital, you'll see notes in the file where the only reason that they are calling Child Protective Service is because the parent has an intellectual disability. Not because of anything they're seeing. Not any lack of interest in the mother or, you know, she's drinking postnatally at the hospital or, you know, anything like that, just the disability. And that's important for you to know. Contacting the courthouse, if you need any sort of accommodations at court, there's a process for that. Every courthouse has to have an ADA coordinator. And the ADA coordinator takes requests for accommodations. They typically go to a judge who rules on them like any other motion, and then they're either granted or denied. 
but this, this process needs to happen if you want to have something in the courtroom. So I understand in Nebraska you get guardian ad litems fairly easily, like almost automatically, if, if you want them, but there may be other things you will need to request. You want to determine what transportation options exist for your client to get to court. Do you guys have paratransit systems? Do you have systems that will pick up people with disabilities and drive them places in Nebraska? Yeah, you do have those. So you want to make sure that that's something that they can get, that it's reliable, that they'll actually get there on time. They often have a difficult time with uh, structured appointment times, the executive functioning of being able to plan and get out the door and get there on time. And when they have unreliable transportation, it can often result in your client not showing for court. And then everyone believes that they aren't motivated, aren't involved, don't care, didn't show up. Um, you might want to walk through the courthouse and actually discuss with your client what's going to happen. Now, that's something that probably would be good for most clients, right? Because everybody gets this idea that it's going to be like law and order and there's going to be like a huge jury. And Do you guys have jury trials on child welfare? Okay. It's like Oklahoma does. So in some cases that will be the case, but it's very unusual. So for them to just go and be in that space, see what's going to happen, have you tell them, can be um, a major way to take away some of the stress and the fearfulness from, from this population before they enter the courthouse. So they'll be better clients and be able to work with you more effectively. If it's just disability, if that's the only reason that your client's child is being pulled, and we do see that. We see that with intellectual disability, blindness, deafness, physical, um, across the country, not particularly to Nebraska. Um, you know, you may want to go through more aggressive tactics. You may need to contact media and let them know what's going on. You may need to file a writ to address this as a violation, a civil rights violation. Filing in the federal court and arguing violation of the ADA and removing the child solely based on status with no neglect or abuse occurring. Um, filing an administrative complaint with the child welfare agency itself internally. <coughs> filing a complaint with the Department of Justice, civil rights sector, section. The civil rights section basically pays attention to an issue when enough people complain about it. And if enough people complain about a system violating the ADA, then they can go and investigate that system. And when they come in with investigative powers, they're extremely broad. And they're able often to negotiate some sort of understanding and an agreement, a formal agreement of how the system can remedy this recurring pattern of violations. So it used to be that um, health and welfare, um, health and human services, HHS, at the federal level would be the only one to investigate um, social services. But with the new regulations, and the ADA was amended, and there have been new regulations promulgated in 2010, um, there's more of a shared jurisdiction. So if you're saying that, you know, that this is an issue you want the Department of Justice to intervene in, it's possible they could do that. They may still move it to Health and Human Services, but they may deal with it directly as well. At emergency removals, you want to determine if accommodations are in place that you felt are needed. You want to plead that the ADA is, is being violated if you think that that's the case because it's based solely on the parent's status as disabled. And the reason I put that early is because almost all of the work done around this, whether um, it is groups like the Bazelon Center or, or other large um, legal policy groups, say that you have to, if you're going to plead the ADA in these cases, you have to plead it often and plead it early. You can't show up at the end and go, oh, and by the way, we also think you violated the ADA when you didn't give proper services and you didn't give a proper evaluation, and now you're trying to terminate. And by the way, when you took them in the first place. You have to be putting that on the record at each point where you feel that there's a violation occurring. You have to be making constructive efforts, asking for those things, and then when they're denied, saying that you feel that it's, it's a violation. You can't just show up at the end and say that the ADA has been violated, court, you can't do what you're required to do under Adoptions and, and Safe Families Act. You also you know, you want to get that on the record, if possible, that you know, the record and the evidence today tends to support a finding that the parent has a disability and the ADA applies. Now, some courts have been better about doing that than others. Some courts will say, for the record, this case has nothing to do with disability, <laughs> you know, and you end up with that on the record too, but you want to have it there, and especially also if you want to preserve it for appeal. Um, a motion and stipulation for adapted parent-child intervention and assessment, um, and maybe return of the child home condition on a good report. You have to be creative in what you're requesting from the court under the ADA. 
If a child's going to remain out of the home, having really quality, obviously quality foster care is important in all cases, but with this parent population, whatever support they can receive from the foster family in just being welcoming and open and not biased against them can make a huge difference. Um, again, for pre-adjudication motion, some of the same stuff. You really want to have discovery of the medical and educational records of the child as early and as thoroughly as possible. And the reason is that many of these cases are grounded in speculation. They're grounded in an allegation that if not now, at some point, the parent is going to be of detriment to the child because of their disability. I've seen cases where they'll say, yes, they're a good parent now, but in four years, we believe that the child will outpace them educationally and they won't be able to help them with math homework. Well, I'm not going to ever be able to help my kids with math homework, so I really <laughs> fail to see the validity in that allegation. Um, but that's the sort of stuff that you're working against often in court. And so you want to be able to, to, to deal with the speculation by giving concrete evidence that for the time period the child has been in the home, that their health, education, and welfare is, is being sufficiently cared for. Um, I already talked about domestic violence and you know discussing changes of placement if needed. If the child is in a setting, a foster care setting or a family foster setting that is extremely hostile to the parent, these parents, their, their psychological profile, often they will just sort of give up. So it is really important if it's a really hostile placement that you talk about having that placement change. Um, mediations. You don't want to let your client go in and agree to a roster of services really without talking to an expert. Talking to someone, you know, that's my agency, the other part of my agency is clinical and they are more than happy for free, federally funded to provide technical support around what kind of services are the right services for this population. Um, but going in there and having that conversation and signing onto a roster of services that are inadequate make it really hard for you to challenge them later. Um, be aware of extended family pitfalls. With this population there tends to be a lot of, um, there's a tendency with the parents of people with intellectual disabilities to keep them forever children. To sort of view them as not really being competent adults no matter what. And part of that I think comes out of protectiveness and part of it just comes out of a general societal attitude towards these individuals. So there can be where you would think that the parents, the grandparents in these cases, would be very supportive. Their tendency often is more like, I'll take them, than I'll help the parents keep their children. So just be aware of that dynamic. Um, you want to make sure your client is really aware of time, dates for things, and, and the transportation is secure. You're probably going to have to do throughout the case, be checking on that constantly. Again, because of the executive functioning involvement we see with a lot of this population, it's just really difficult for them to get where they need to go when they need to be there. Um, making sure that you have expert witnesses to challenge badly designed or unadapted assessments and services, bad reports that come out as a result of them can be really important. I know that often parents counsel have very little pools of money to work with um, for experts and that's really unfortunate in and of itself. But if you have the option of using that money for you know, your cases, you really, that is really a, a great use of that money because the reports are relied on so heavily and if they're done with improper measures by someone who doesn't have the proper qualifications, they can just be the death knell of your case. Um, so expert, an expert witness on that issue can be really useful. Um, at the point where you're, you're doing your review, your review hearings, I think you, know, you always want to be making sure that you have people there to talk about the progress your client has made. People can get really negative about these parents because the fact is, the thing that brings them into the system is not going to resolve. They're not going to stop having intellectual disabilities. You know, I've had cases where uh, you know, parents have autism, which is a whole emerging issue. So we have this wave of children in this country and we recognize we have a crisis with autism, right? There's this huge wave of kids with autism. Well, as that first wave starts aging into teen and young adult, we're seeing tons of parents with autism. And I've had judges actually say, mom's been provided with services, yet she continues to be autistic. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to continue to have intellectual disability. 
And so in a way, they're sort of seen as like failing, right? We've given you all this help and you still have the same problem that brought you here. Instead of viewing it as this is a, a part of who you are, we're going to provide services so your behaviors are supportive of the well-being of your child. Um, but so you're really going to need to strongly evidence that these parents can and have made progress, whatever progress they've made. When you get to the point, oh wait, sorry, permanency. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the disparate impact of the um, Adoption and Safe Families Act on this population. As I said before, they really take longer to internalize and process and be able to take on new behaviors. So even if you have a really great system that's working like a well-oiled machine and they're getting services, boom, right out the door from the very beginning, um, you know, 18 months, that's a pretty short time, you know? But most of the time, it isn't a well-oiled machine working perfectly. More often, they don't rece start receiving services until halfway through that period. And then they're unable to comply within 18 months. Um, in California, we have case law that, that says that if you know, proper services haven't been provided, the judge can use discretion to continue for a certain period. I don't know what the status is on that in Nebraska. Um, at the termination of parental rights hearing, it's really important, again, to focus on the behavior of the parent, the improvements that they've made to attack wherever they haven't gotten proper services or evaluations. You want to focus also on the best interest of the child and having a continuing relationship with these parents. Quite often, these parents are not abusive. You know, they haven't harmed their child. They do love their child. There is a bond. So what is the harm in continuing that relationship? Um, there's usually a two-part showing to terminate. One, that the child can be placed in a permanent home if you terminate this one, and that that would be in their best interest. So this is a unique uh, place in the law, which is that these parents quite often haven't harmed their child, but there's, specu there's speculation that at some point they'll be detrimental. So they do often have a more intact relationship. Um, also, help the parent to sort of voice what they want to say. When I take calls from parents all over the country, they really feel like they didn't get to say what they wanted to say about this process, about their relationship, about how they feel about their child. Um, but they never got to, to say anything about that. And I think it's really important for them because they have histories often of pretty much being told to shut up and sit down. So it can be really you know, um, important for them to at least have had that opportunity to read a statement or have one read for them. And also, you know, be prepared to appeal largely on insufficiency of evidence as to unfitness if there's a termination of parental rights and you feel it was improper. So if, they, if you asked for all of those accommodations around parent-child work and intervention and you asked for uh, accommodated evaluations and you never got them, then how have they really sufficiently evidenced that the parent's incapable? How have they shown that the parent is unfit if they never gave them the services that they required in order to show any success, have any opportunity to show that they could be successful. In conclusion, you know, this population of families, as I said, is probably the most vulnerable in the system. They really are not able to advocate for themselves well. You know more about it than most people in the world now. So hopefully that will be helpful to you. And I say in the world because it really is a worldwide problem. The United Nations Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, Article 23, is called the right to home and family. And the whole focus of that article is that these families are so vulnerable that countries either remove children because the children have a disability and institutionalize them, or take children away from their parents who have disabilities without the state providing any assistance that is meaningful for them. And we're not yet a ratifying party to the convention, but we are signatory. And there are over 160 ratifying nations around the world. So we need to be doing this work, not because it's our special problem, it's a problem all over the world, but we need to do the work because, you know, America started the disability rights movement and we should be the ones addressing disability rights in the context of family. My program, the, the National Center for Parents with Disabilities and Their Families, there's the website, and you can, there's an email link there. You can email me directly if you have questions on cases, if you need resources. We have written resources. We have contacts in different states that can provide proper assessments and interventions. Um, we have a large collection of case law. And even though there's not a ton in Nebraska, 
there's a lot of persuasive case law from other states on points that just have not been addressed yet in your, um, uh, at the appeals level here. And then the PowerPoint is not yet on this site. Um, my tech guy had issues. So, but this is where you can find it temporarily. And then um, it'll be at the higher, uh, the website, the PWD legal program. It'll be there within a week. So, okay, so questions? Yes? Typically, we try to fit this population into our existing system as opposed to modifying our system to help this population. And what we, if I could just generalize all cases, it usually results in removal from the hospital based on what you talked about. Mm -hmm. And then we go through this process where we teach them everything they need to know to parent a six month old and be concerned about can parent a 12 month old. And then we teach them for everything for that. And then we get to the 18 month old. You know, how can we kind of just stop that? Because the assessments that we're getting, I don't think are by any experts qualified with low functioning populations. I think they're, again, they're doing the same assessment they would for you or I. Mm -hmm. And they're scoring it differently. They're maybe doing one hour of, of actual visitation monitoring or interaction monitoring. And it doesn't seem like we really, I mean, a lot of people in Lancaster County, it doesn't seem like we really do much to help this population. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, you're seeing exactly what people see all over, which is that, you know, okay, you've told me what should happen, now how am I supposed to find that where I am, right? Because the connections haven't been made often between places like um, uh, university centers on development and the community that could actually use those out in the real world, like attorneys looking for parent-child intervention work. So I think that you, what you have to do is locally in your own area, work together with the disability community to see where those resources might exist, someone who does have proper qualifications. And sometimes what you have to do is do teamwork, where you have someone who has expertise in intellectual disability and someone who has expertise in parenting and parent-child intervention and team them together so that you're making up for the deficit of one with the other. So the parent person is going, you know, I taught them that the child shouldn't stand on the chair at 18 months because that's dangerous. But they let the child stand on the windowsill. They don't get, they don't, they don't extrapolate, right? That not standing on the chair, standing on the chair is dangerous. So is standing on the windowsill. It's not just the chair, not just standing on the chair. So the person who has expertise in intellectual disability has the expertise to know how to help that parent extrapolate that standing on the chair is dangerous and so is standing on the windowsill. The way you teach them, the manner you use, the techniques you use, that's a specialized set of skills. And so if you can put together the two, even if you don't have them in one person or one agency, you can usually do better than what you're probably seeing happening now. Um, and it's, you know, it's one of those things of networking too, like if you guys can start to network with the disability community and the university systems, we often just find good connections to the university systems, um, then you can start putting together a roster of people that are useful in working with these families, evaluating these families. But how can you effectively make that argument to return home and have that person in the care of the child? Because what we routinely have is this population generally goes to all the visits, they generally go to all the appointments, they do everything they're supposed to do. And we're, we're left with people saying, oh, they tried so hard. If there was only a home where we could just put them with the child, with someone else there, everything would be just fine. We just don't feel we can send the kid back home. Right, they want like foster family yeah. settings, I, I, I like for the, the whole family. Well, you know, there's also like, what are they basing that on? What, are, what is it that makes them believe they can't put the child back in the home? If you're saying, you know, they look good with a six month old with help, they look good with a 12 month old with help, but what is the, what's backing up this feeling that they won't be able to be good going forward? You know, and are the, are the people who have that feeling actually adequately trained to be making that <coughs> judgment? I mean, what we're supposed to be doing under the law, right, under Santosky, under, you know, United States Supreme Court law, you can only intervene if a parent is unfit. And we have measures of unfit. Are they able to manage for their health, education, and welfare, basically? And if they're doing that, we really don't have endless discretion to keep speculating about what we think might or might not happen, or to require the parent to be a parent that's a middle-class parent, either. You know, there are a lot of people that wouldn't qualify as good enough parents if we held them to the standards we're holding these parents to, of looking perfect under a microscope. You know, so I mean, part of it is in making sure that the, um, the services you're getting are the right services, the people making judgments have the right qualifications to make those judgments. 
but also in remembering what the standard is legally that we can ask of a family. Um, because these families cause alarm because the intellectual disability and, psych and psychiatric as well cause such alarm in us. Um, we can sometimes hold them to much higher standards than we're holding other people in similar situations. Yes? It looks like you're trying to change the standard. Mm -hmm. I mean, the standard for a judge, paramount is safety. Mm -hmm. And you're telling me I have a person in front of me that has a persistent disability that is probably going to require services over the life of the minority of the child. And you're trying to tell me that ADA trumps asthma. And I don't think there's any authority anywhere that says ADA trumps asthma. I don't think I said the ADA trumps asthma. I said judges With have used life, discretion to have some extra asthma, time in cases. Keep ignoring asthma and argue ADA. A judge doesn't have that privilege because asthma is our first bond is that we're supposed to get to permanency. And we adopted a public policy, whether or not it's good or not, it's a legislative issue. But the public policy is safety is paramount, and permanency is the next most important. And they almost sound mutually exclusive. Now, in my whole And can I answer career, that so far, where you've gone so far? I have never gotten I guess a not. case of an ID person that didn't come to me because the kids were out wandering around unsupervised in the winter in their diapers. There was some danger to the child. I've never seen one come from the hospital just because this is an intellectually disabled person. There's always an incident or two or a series. Well, let me, let me disabuse you of that notion because, in fact, I work nationally and there are many cases like that. And not just with ID, with parents who are blind, with parents who are deaf, with parents who are bipolar, with parents who have all kinds of diagnoses. So quite frankly, because you haven't had that in your county, in your career, is not just positive of the fact that it does occur. And it does, in fact, occur. Secondly, I'm not arguing that the ADA trumps ASFA. What I'm saying is that you must follow federal law in your complicity with ASFA so that if a parent does need a modification to a service that, and you'll recall, ASFA's major priority, their number one priority, is supposed to be reunification. And permanency of the child is the ultimate goal, but reunification is supposed to be the first best plan for the child. That's why we have concurrent, and we are hoping they'll be able to reunify. But the idea is that while you're attempting reunification, that you should follow federal law that says that you should accommodate or modify services, interventions, and procedures in order to allow the parents to have a fair opportunity to utilize that system. And once you've satisfied that, if the parent cannot ultimately show that they can care for the child, you must terminate and find another setting. However, until that point, you are required to follow both the ADA and ASFA. They're not mutually exclusive, they're mutually required. So I would ask that that would be the message more, that they are both required well, first, to be followed. I've got to follow Nebraska. I'm in Nebraska. Well, I think we discussed Nebraska law, and it too says that there must be a nexus. Well, Nebraska is pretty clear on, on a, if there's expert, and I agree it has to be a qualified expert, it says this is a persistent situation that despite the best efforts of the parent is not likely to be remedied within a reasonable length of time, then our case law says you turn it. Now, I, I think that's hard. So in your, but in your argument, what you're saying is basically having the diagnosis that is not going to go away, you're equating that to having a diagnosis that's creating a disparate negative impact on a child. And that's not necessarily the case. Those two are not necessarily the same. There are parents who have intellectual disability who parent successfully. I agree. So having the diagnosis in and of itself is not a basis to assume that you'll be terminating whether it's persistent or it's short term or it's otherwise. So that's sort of the point, is that federal law requires that just the status in and of itself should typically not cause these people to be treated in a different way than other consumers of these services. And that in fact you need to make modifications and make additional efforts, if needed, for them to be able to have some opportunity at success in the system. And we're asking that of course Nebraska law applies. But the last time I checked, federal law applies to Nebraska as well. So that does need to be followed too. Thank you. Yeah. I think one of the challenges in this whole process, though, is for that parent who has a diagnosis that's not going away, 
um, but have some capability of doing the parenting is finding those support services to help them continue parenting that child to the age of support, the right. age of majority. Those are far and few between in many places. And there are parents that could be doing it, but they don't have that, that resource in the community to help them continue to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge burden. That's a huge hurdle. Right. Yeah, no, clearly. I mean, there are areas in the country where there is just, there's very little for people to work with. As we were discussing, sometimes you have to be creative and look at melding members into a more of a team. You know, and in many areas, they have multidisciplinary teams that address a parent's needs, a family's needs, and social services. And being able to pull together people from different areas of expertise can be useful. You don't even always have that opportunity. Sometimes there's simply no one that's working with this group. I would say that intellectual disability is, that's a population where there has been some structure set up nationally. So you do have resources like the ARC or like um, developmental disability councils that are sometimes um, work with state government um, on dealing with the needs of people with developmental disabilities and that those might be places to start to try to find if there are resources that you're missing at all in your area. So some of the larger national or larger state systems might be useful. It would be great if every place had a nonprofit or you know, um, a, a private entity to uh, provide that service, but you're right, that's just not the case in the places. And I think sometimes it's just a step that's being skipped. Yeah, and it also, it, yeah, that's true too, because you know, it's interesting, I'll get calls on cases and the attorneys will say, you know, they say that they've um, made reasonable efforts, but I don't think, they haven't done anything, actually. They haven't looked anywhere. And, you know, one of the things is, like, ask them if they ever looked us up, because we're the national center for this. And all it takes is, like, a Google connection, and you type in parent with a disability, and boom, there we are. And if they haven't even bothered with a Google search, is that a reasonable effort? You know, I mean, and I tell you, I get very few calls from social services. When I do, it's great, because it means you really have you know, something to work with there. They're, they're interested and they're looking for services. Um, but you're right that they, that often is a step that gets skipped. Yeah. And you know, and part of this is about this, the problems in society in general that we don't have enough focus on this population of parents. When I was doing quantitative research and looking at ca court case samples at different um, courthouses all in the country, um, Minnesota, for instance, actually tests everyone coming in, every parent, to see if there's intellectual um, or developmental disability in the parent, right? They're the only one I know of that does that. And the rates, I'm sorry? How do they justify testing everyone? You know what? I don't know how they develop that system, but they are testing them. But actually what happens is that you can see a number. So they end up with parents with um, intellectual developmental disability, and the case sample we looked at was almost 60%. That's huge, right? Now in places where they don't track it at all, and we went in and did court samples, we never got that high of a number. But we got rates that were pretty high, you know, pretty substantial um, portion of the child welfare parent population has disabilities, including intellectual disabilities. And the fact is that there's no special money given to social services or to the courts or to attorneys to get training on how to deal with this population or any special money to develop services for this population. They're basically, you're all being asked to deal with this population with absolutely no extra help. And, you know, it's, and they're more challenging families often. Any other questions? So are you talking about parents where their disability has been identified by the state or by someone else and that's the reason they're involved with the state but they're kind of in denial, like, no, I don't have that. Yeah, or, okay. I mean, even if you, you go to the first, you know, couple of court hearings or whatever, 
they've been identified, they're assigned with our unit at Lido because obviously they need some extra assistance during the board proceedings and that kind of stuff. But they themselves, the parents, are in denial. You, you identify that they're going to need and require some extra services, but if the parents are in denial, then they're going to fight with you and say, oh, well, I don't have these problems, I don't have to do these services. And then you, I mean, you, you try, but how do you get them involved so that way you can say, we need to do this in order to find out if you can hurt your kids or not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one thing to understand is that there's such incredible level of shame associated with this disability. I mean, you know, calling people a retard is like the, like the worst thing, you know, you can say, right, growing up. And that's, they have been so mistreated often and so shamed that they will, yeah, they will deny it. Or they'll say, um, I just I have a learning disability. I'm dyslexic. That's why I can't read, you know, but they, they don't want to own that diagnosis, yeah. Um, I mean, there is only so much you can do as an attorney, right? Um, someone who's a therapist who's working, like I talked earlier, a therapist who's working with them themselves, um, a general therapist for them, can help them maybe work through that and come to accept services. Now, will it happen fast enough for the case? I don't know. But it, that is a really difficult thing as an attorney. I mean, you can kind of outline it as, you know what, have them, don't have them. But the fact is that these services are being offered. And this is what you're required to do. So we need to do this. You know, that, that's something that I've done when I'm dealing with parents on the, and it's easier for me because I'm not their counsel. You know, either I'm a third party. But, you know, saying, you know, it's, it's a little bit, you got to think of it a little bit as, you know, being a good soldier. You just kind of got to go in there and do it. Like, this is what you're being asked to do. You need to do this. Um, whatever it takes to get your kid, right? Whatever it takes. So whether they're going in wanting to or not, you know, if you, behaviorally, you know, if you get them in there and getting the services, then you may still get some positive outcome. But there is only so much you can do about an uncooperative parent um, as an attorney if it's based on sort of all that psychological trauma around um, not wanting to own being intellectually disabled. Yeah. Anyone else? And this, this may be more uh, theoretic, but are there states where there has been a permanency plan achieved that is reunification with the children with the idea that there's going to be ongoing support from somebody, maybe not social services, but Department of Disability, where they've assured that the, that the court has assured itself and the, and the system that this parent now owns their disability and is willing to accept help during the different stages of the child's aging. Is, is right. um, I haven't seen that. I think that courts, I think probably th their requirement is that they feel they can end this case. So I don't know, I've never seen an order of, of like permanency with a stipulation that they're going to continue in these services and be you know, back with the parent. Um, what I have seen is children being returned home at the time of, of a permanency hearing because of a showing that they are adequately supported and plugged into the right resources in their community, including resources that will help them. I think you mentioned this, that there's that thing of how do you continually play catch up, right? When kids are developing all the time, right? They're always changing. And most good community resources for these parents will follow them. Now, are they going to need intensive, you know, twice a week, two hours? No. But just checking in, working with them to help them stay ahead of the curve on that development change, that, that is considered um, best practice for supporting these parents in Australia, in Sweden, in the United States, in Canada, that that piece should always be there. We're often focused on what are we going to do to triage and deal with right now while we're in the system. But, but usually, if you have a general family in the community, best practice is to have them have, re, have a resource in the community that is able to work with them on an ongoing basis, because kids do change. And you know, we've had a lot of success. My agency is a clinical agency, as I said, for the most part. Um, and we're only able to do our work locally with families. But they, the national rates for removal for parents with intellectual disability hovers around like 40%. It's around 40%, and that's pretty consistent in many countries. 
Um, but when parents are worked with in our agency, we are able to drop that down to between, I think, like 2 and 7%, depending on the population. So with that type of intensive beginning work and then just sort of having someone there as a support in the community for them, um, you can get very good results, uh, very good outcomes. And, and this issue of not having adequate resources is something that we know needs to be addressed. Um, we just finished doing a policy paper with the National Council on Disability and their policy paper, paper system, they constantly are doing policy papers around disability. They are an advisory group to the executive and the legislative. And one of their policy papers became the ADA. So they are, you know, that's, their work is very much concrete in developing policy. And we just did a paper with them called Rocking the Cradle, Parents with um, Ensuring the Rights of Parents with Disabilities and Their Families. And one of the major recommendations included is that we need to have agencies like the good ones we see nationally that can support these parents. We need to have them um, properly funded and in every, at least to start with, every federal region and then begin working to every state and, and making them available. Because you, you really, even if you know exactly what to do, you are gonna have to spend a lot of time often finding and building those resources. Um, and there's just, you know, that's just unfortunately the state of the nation right now. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you guys all for attending. And <laughs>